thank you for your attention today and give you a few minutes to ask uh, questions now. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you for that impassioned talk. Uh, what has the reaction of the public and of healthcare professionals been since September 15 when you unveiled the call to action? Right. Well, unfortunately, there's a lot of education that still has to take place, but the feedback that I've gotten from every single healthcare practitioner, every single interviewer, the trade press, and other people in medicine has been very, very positive. So I think we have a lot of work to do, but this is, this is the right first step. I wonder if our faculty, uh, Dr. Conrad or Vicky, have any uh, questions? Fred? I think uh, I'm sure you're aware of some work that Sam and uh, others have done using the electronic, electronic medical record mm -hmm. to predict patients who would most benefit from of prophylaxis. Yes. And with the uh, initiatives that are being discussed at the national level right. about the use of EMR, uh, is there um, some consideration <coughs> for a couple of those to be sort of connected with that initiative? Right. So, thank you. Yeah, thank you for asking that. And, um, you know, I'm not allowed to lobby, but let me just tell you, you need to get in contact with your member of Congress. The economic stimulus package that is going through Congress right now has been passed by the House. It's going to the Senate. Uh, the provision, very, very complicated, um, large provision. It has many hundreds of millions of dollars in there to support the development of electronic medical records. And what I've heard all around the country is without big federal investments, it's going to take a really, really long time. But I think these types of steps to be able to use electronic medical records to predict patients at risk of these conditions is a tremendously important step, uh, but it's not, we're not quite there yet. Dr. Cohn. <coughs> With all due respect, I'd like to ask a political question. <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> uh, I really enjoyed your, your discussion. It's right on the mark. Uh, these are great projects, and I agree, and I think all of us here agree with everything you said, but how likely is this to change with sort of new appointments and changes in a whole new presidential cabinet and a new kind of uh, trust in almost every aspect of the government? Is, is the health care sort of, uh, like these things that you described, are they sort of above the fray, or are they part of the mix? Well, it's, it's a little bit early to say. I feel like they're in... Yeah, yeah, the, the, just to summarize the question, how important are uh, improvements in our health care system to the incoming in administrations at the, uh, uh, yeah, the, the installation of what you asked? Um, certainly being in the headquarters of Health and Human Services, I feel like they're high up. If you look at the rhetoric in the campaign, if you look at, uh, pay attention to uh, the president, uh, the new president's uh, uh, communications around the transition time, around the inauguration. He has talked about health a lot. He's appointed a uh, Secretary of Health and Human Services who isn't quite confirmed yet, who has published about health care, about the need for health care reform. So I think, I believe, it's going to be very high on the priority list. But of course, it's a, a little bit too early to say for sure. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Fareed. Well, I'm just very grateful to you for the most eloquent of the presentation and summarizing all of that. And we are very thankful to Sam and all the people who presented today. And it's a privilege for us to have you here. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm honored to be here. Any other questions for the Surgeon General? Yes. I'm not a uh, medical practitioner myself, but I, I work here in a biotech company. But I have a brother who's in primary care, <coughs> and he's the uh, head of a medical clinic, or was, or was, at the University of North Carolina. And what he describes to me is a, is a situation where, in primary care, reimbursement for him, particularly for Medicare, is so bad yes. that if he had 100% of his patients, Medicare patients, which would be his most complicated patients, that he wouldn't be able to pay the overhead for his clinic. And as he describes, and I'm, this is just I'm relating what he's saying, 
but this is driving people out of primary care. And so how do we enhance prevention when we're driving, when our government policies are driving the first line of prevention out of, right. out of that? Got it, got it. And the message is, that just to summarize, what are we going to do about the problem of uh, not enough practitioners going into primary care, considering this is the most cost-effective way to reach the millions of uninsured uh, in this country and really help bring up the basic level of health? And we really do have a primary care crisis in this country. As the, the dad of some uh, uh, incoming medical students, the, one of the problems is the cost of going to medical school convinces a lot of physicians that they don't want to deal with that kind of loan burden and they need to go into a specialty that uh, gets their loans paid off quickly. We have got to do something about this problem. I am very hopeful from looking at the discussions that have taken place during the presidential campaign. Uh, President Obama has spoken a lot about prevention. There are a, a, a number of the people that he's brought into his health care team are extremely aware of this problem in primary care. And I, I think that as we see health care reform unfold over the next couple of years, there will be uh, some solutions. And it, a lot of it involves economic incentives for going into primary care, frankly. We're not going to fix that without changing the economic equation. So I think we... We have a lot of people focused on that, and I'm, I'm hopeful that uh, the stars have aligned uh, in a better way than they have in many, many years to try to address this. Yes, ma'am. I, I just going back to uh, your presentation it was so incredibly eloquent. Is the NATF going to be able to offer us a, a copy of that at some point? Because I know taking this back to the hospital will come back to update. <laughs> I'd be happy to get you a written. It has, has some scribbles on it, but I'll, I'll fix it up and get it to Sammy. I don't know if you have a way to distribute it or put it on the web or something. That's fine. Absolutely. We'll need a lot more coming from you than from me. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, for one thing, we can put it on our web page. Sure. No, that's fine. Well, we're happy to do that. Thank you. Yeah. Please. Page 24 of the Ecola Action cites a study done in this hospital where, with, uh, in response to alerting the system, the uh, initiation of prophylaxis increased from 14.5 to 40 percent. My interpretation is that still means 60 percent of very competent physicians were not uh, initiating prophylaxis, and I wonder whether that's been studied and uh, what the results might have been. I guess I should take that Wait. question, <laughs> but this is my study. And, and uh, yes, I mean, that, that study using this very sophisticated system of electronic medical alerts and working for two years with our information technologists here to be able to create these alerts uh, resulted in a 40% reduction in symptomatic DVT and pulmonary embolism over the next three months. However, uh, the study also suggested, as you rightly point out, that we have a long way to go because although we tripled the frequency of prophylaxis by alerting the responsible doctor, still more than half of those patients uh, were not prophylaxed. And I can tell you we're engaged right now at Brigham and Women's and in multi-centered trials on ways to bring that number up much higher. And um, I hope to report to you at some future symposium uh, the results of that work. <coughs> and hopefully we'll, you'll publish that and other hospitals will take it and try to follow the same route because that's, that's really what needed, what's needed is best practices developed that then can be generalized in different institutions around the country. Please. Uh, I'm not a physician, I'm not in the medical community, but I do work with physicians to help them manage their quality of life more effectively and efficiently. I'm a coach. Coach. One of the things I hear all the time is the stress that physicians are under in trying to um, diagnose in the amount of minutes they're allowed to see patients. What I've heard today so much is the importance of that diagnosis for preventative purposes. What suggestions do you have in regard to that, and are you doing something about that on a national level? Well, I think on a national level, uh, we need to uh, 
again, it's we need to modify the economic formula to allow experts in prevention uh, to do their do their work, to allow uh, enough time for practitioners to uh, talk to patients, uh, to be able to develop electronic systems that enable uh, a physician or any kind of healthcare practitioner to sit down and see an electronic profile in front of them that tells them what they have to communicate to that patient to prevent key uh, conditions. So it's, it's a combination of our reimbursement system improving to recognize prevention is, and uh, improvements in technology, I think, as well as education. Uh, many healthcare practitioners in this country don't think enough about prevention, and I'd like to see uh, medical schools, nursing schools, all healthcare practitioners spend more time in their educational systems understanding the importance of prevention and how to implement it in their practices. John Finikos? Uh, yeah, first of all, I want to thank you uh, for coming again. Uh, I must say, with the enormous amount of resources we have, and we heard it in uh, the expertise of our, our medical staff, um, and we're able to bring you to Boston to this facility, and I think we're well recognized for what we do. Um, on behalf of the facilities that don't have as much resources, what can they count on from the Surgeon General's office relative to the call to action in the next coming months? What can they expect and what can they capitalize on to bring um, to their medical staffs and to their uh, nursing staffs uh, to, to prevent this disease? Right, right. Well, uh, those of you who are familiar with the Office of the Surgeon General know that you know we're not uh, part of you know the the the, the part of the federal government that gives out grants. We're a, really a skeleton staff with major, with mostly an educational mission. So what we can do is provide leadership, provide tools like the call to action, but it's really up to people out there, either patient groups or leaders of professional organizations to take the tool like the call to action and do what they can in their own environment, in their own institution. So we can provide leadership, and leadership is very, very important, but we can't actually provide you know, resources or an army of people to go out around the country. I wish we could, but it's really up to everybody uh, in this room and, and those of you who have colleagues in those institutions to help them become aware in your professional organizations or other settings about these same tools that they, so that they can use them as well. Please. Um, you mentioned health literacy, and I was wondering what role do you see our current public education system playing in the development of health literacy? Well, our public education system is absolutely critical. We have to do a better job of teaching our young people from their very, very first uh, exposures to the educational system, I think, in kindergarten, to understanding terms around health, to understanding what they can do in prevention, to understand what it means to eat a healthy diet and get a good level of physical activity and basic information about health, uh, which we're not doing enough in our very, with our very young kids and all the way up uh, through universities. There are people who graduate from college without, without knowing the first thing about the importance of diet and exercise and staying healthy. So really, I think it's a responsibility of our entire health system in this country. We do have some special challenges. We have Americans who speak many, many different languages. We have very different uh, levels of quality in our educational system, depending on where you live. And it's, it's really a challenge for everyone to try to, to improve this. No one, no one solution. Please. Besides the obvious impact on patient, patient care and benefits of prophylaxis, <coughs> what do you think the economic impacts would be to the healthcare system if patients were properly, properly prophylaxed? Yeah, um, I don't know if we, were, were there as cost estimates in the call to action? I don't have them at the well, tip of my tongue. Yeah, it's big. It's big. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's got to be. <laughs> It's got to be in the hundreds of millions of dollars. If you think about 350 to 600,000 uh, occurrences every year and the cost of a typical hospitalization, not to talk of the cost of monetizing preventable deaths. So it's, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars, certainly. Please. 
Well, I think patient advocacy groups are enormously important in getting the word out uh, because it won't, just by talking to healthcare professions, uh, you're not going to make a difference about, you know, for example, all the women who are taking hormones to know that taking those hormones, if they, they balance risk and benefit in that decision to take the hormones, but they need to understand that they still may be at elevated risk of DVT and PD. That sort of word does not get out without a lot of people getting on the bandwagon. So it's not there's no simple formula, but getting all the components in our healthcare system involved from patient groups to all the different healthcare practitioners. Uh, practitioners. So there's a role for everyone is my major message. Well, uh, I want to first of all thank you and your staff. Uh, you have so many requests for speaking, and uh, in September you agreed uh, readily to come to Brigham and Women's, and we're most appreciative. I also want to thank our faculty for this pulmonary embolism symposium, and our staff, uh, particularly Dr. Eileen Sussman. I think many of you know her as she pre-registered the more than 350 individuals who signed up for today's symposium, and Jonathan Sonis, uh, uh, who is also a member of the NATF staff, and also the Venus Thromboembolism Research Group staff, which helped a lot uh, to organize today's visit. And uh, hopefully this is just the beginning of a new more proactive stage and that we'll continue to be able to communicate and work together. And uh, we all, I think, should uh, stand up and wish you very, very well. And thank you for everything you did.